Welcome to Iron Sharpens Iron. I am Jeremy Nettles, the evangelist for the River Ridge Church of Christ in Newburgh, Indiana. We've been going through overviews of each division of the books of the Bible. So far, we've done broad looks at the whole thing, at the Old Testament, at the New Testament, the Torah, the Gospels, the Old Testament history books, and the New Testament history book, as well as what early history we can stitch together from the letters. You can find all of those if you'd like to go back and watch them, either again or for the first time, if you're just now finding us, by going to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash River Ridge Church of Christ, and selecting the playlist very creatively named The Whole Bible. For today, we're examining the Old Testament books of poetry, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. Let's start with Job. Job is different. It's the only book in the Old Testament that isn't focused on the nation of Israel in one way or another. In fact, it's not clear at all whether any of the main characters are even Jewish. The author obviously is, but aside from a couple of clearly Hebrew names, the rest is not clear. Oh, and we have no idea when it was written, except that it's probably not long before Genesis was written, and certainly not after the Babylonian exile. That's a rather wide range of possible dates. Let's read the first five verses of the book. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the east. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. Okay, so a very wealthy and devout individual who even takes pains to atone for his children's potential sins. Happy, healthy family. What happens? Verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. God is bragging to Satan that Job isn't susceptible to Satan's attacks, and Satan is crying foul. Just contemplate the audacity of this character for a moment. He's trying to subvert the Lord of the universe and lead mankind to everlasting destruction out of hatred for both man and God, and he's complaining that God is making it unfairly difficult. Well, God takes the bet, but imposes a limit. You said his possessions were the reason for his love. Fine, take them all away. But confine it to his possessions, since that's where you said the problem lies. I'm going to read the rest of the chapter. It's a little longer than most of our normal readings here, but I want you to experience as nearly as possible the full weight of the impact of this scene. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And there came a messenger to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans fell among them and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another, and said, The Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another, and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young people, and they are dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. 
Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. So that sounds horrible, but Job retains his integrity, and while he mourns the loss, he blesses God rather than cursing him, spoiling Satan's prediction. In the next chapter, Satan gets permission to take it to the next level and gives Job a horribly uncomfortable illness to top it all off, but Job stands fast. Let's read what he says in verses 11 through 13 of chapter 2. Now when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that had come upon him, they came each from his own place, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite. They made an appointment together to come to show him sympathy and comfort him. And when they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him. And they raised their voices and wept, and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads toward heaven. And they sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was very great." It goes downhill from there. Job starts to vent his frustration and mourn his loss and his existence, and so far things are uh, okay. His friends are sitting with him, listening to what he's suffered and how he feels, and their presence is, if not a comfort per se, at least an indicator to him that he doesn't have to suffer all of this alone, doesn't have to carry the weight without any help. And then, as so often happens, the friends proceed to ruin everything by flapping their lips. They don't think they're hurting matters, they think it's the right thing to do. But it's worse than worthless, in fact. The three friends spend the next 29 chapters arguing with Job, telling him that he deserved all of this and needs to repent. Of what? They don't know. But they're convinced every deed is repaid in this life, and so if the repayment Job is receiving is of this sort, well, it must indicate that someone up there isn't too fond of him because of something he did. Job gets increasingly frustrated, arguing rightly that these sufferings are not in payment for some sin on his part. He's not perfect, but this is obviously lopsided. There are obviously wicked people who never suffer anything like this, and in fact, the righteous are often their victims. So what gives? Job's frustration leads him to the point of claiming that he could successfully argue his case before God, that he had done no wrong and his suffering was unjust. This was basically accurate, but he goes a little overboard in the way he expresses it. Finally, a fourth friend chimes in and speaks on God's behalf, saying that the other three are jerks who don't know what they're talking about, and that Job is getting above his pay grade in justifying himself rather than God. He goes on at some length like this, filling chapters 32 through 37. In chapter 38, God himself joins their little discussion and reminds them all just how far above them he is. He doesn't address all of their concerns. It's not about logic. It's about authority. He's telling Job and his friends, I know what I'm doing, and that should be enough for you. And Job agrees. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? That's what God had said to him. Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear and I will speak, I will question you, and you make it known to me. That's another thing God said to him. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes." In the end, God blesses Job more than at the beginning. There's a lot more baggage to this story, of course, but let's focus on the ending. Job wasn't perfect to begin with. He wasn't perfect through the whole ordeal. But he didn't blame or curse God, and aside from a bad attitude part of the time, he pleased God in how he dealt with his suffering. And God rewarded him. This is a great lesson for us, although we ought to understand both the physical and spiritual sides of it. Just as we shouldn't expect suffering to only be the direct result of our own sin, we also shouldn't expect a full reward for righteousness to come to us in the present life. Let's move on to Psalms. There are 150 of these, so let's get started. Okay, we're not really going to read all of these, but while that might sound daunting, most of them are actually quite short. Let's read a handful of the shorter ones to help us get an idea of what to expect. The first and quintessential psalm is the most important one we should read to get a feel for the whole collection. 
Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. This psalm draws a contrast between those who serve God and those who don't. It predicts every kind of success to the righteous and every kind of failure for the wicked. Now, in the physical world, we don't see things lining up quite so neatly, do we? Remember Job? But that's not the point. It's A, about the general rule, and B, a hint of spiritual things to come. Psalm 15, a psalm of David. O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly and does what is right, and speaks truth in his heart, who does not slander with his tongue, and does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord, who swears to his own hurt and does not change, who does not put out his money at interest, and does not take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved." This one was attributed to King David, and knowing that, we can see his question in light of not only being allowed in God's presence at the early prototype of the temple in Jerusalem, but also being allowed to reign as king from that same mountain. He affirms the value of morally upright behaviors and says something similar to what we found in Psalm 1, that the one who behaves righteously will not be moved. Now's a good time to mention that David is listed as the author of very nearly every psalm in Book 1. Other authors are sometimes listed in the other books, and sometimes none is given. And the convention is to refer to the author of any given psalm as the psalmist, not to be confused with the palmist, which, in fairness, is a common point of confusion among people who've never given five minutes' attention to God's Word. Moving on! What's this book one, you ask? Well, since it's kind of a long collection and it was being written down on scrolls, you can see why it would have been necessary to divide them up. There are also some broad thematic similarities between each book, but trying to come up with a rhyme or reason for the exact arrangement is a fruitless task. The 150 Psalms are divided into five books. Book 1 goes up through Psalm 41, and then with Psalm 42, we're in Book 2. Book 3 starts at Psalm 73, Book 4 at Psalm 90, and Book 5 contains Psalms 107 through 150. It's not exactly an even spread. Through the course of the collection, we see poems that praise God either from an individual or corporate perspective, others that are prayers for help on behalf of an individual or the nation of Israel, some that are teaching tools, some that rehearse Israel's history, some that predict God's judgments and blessings, and still others that are sort of seasonal songs. And then there are a bunch that blend two or more of these general categories. It's a jumble. Some are obviously intended to be sung, often with accompaniment, and often in the course of temple worship. Others are intended to be recited, either by individuals or by groups. We don't have time to look at examples of each of these, but a couple bear mentioning. Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? O my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. You may recognize this one from much later. Jesus spoke the opening words of this psalm from the cross, opening the door to heated theological debate for centuries to come. But I'm more interested in pointing out today that the rest of this psalm is just chock full of prophecies that Jesus would fulfill. It's not unique in this. Many of the psalms are messianic to some degree, and it's even quite easy to go overboard and see Jesus in just about every line of just about every psalm. That's not entirely a mistake. There's no denying a bunch of those prophecies are really there. The problem comes when people stop paying attention to the more earthly, temporal meaning behind the Psalms as they were originally written. The stuff about Jesus is more important by a long shot, but we'll fail to understand Jesus adequately if we stop paying attention to the cultural experience and story into which he was born. Jumping far ahead... Psalm 117 stands out as the shortest chapter in the Bible. It's only two verses long. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol Him, all peoples. For great is His steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Short, sweet, and to the point. 
Psalm 119 stands out as the longest chapter in the Bible, and it's not a particularly close competition. We're not going to read it right now, but it's definitely worth your time. It's an acrostic, which means 22 sections, each built around a letter in the Hebrew alphabet, or alephbet if you're pedantic. Each section comprises eight verses, and each verse begins with the letter currently in focus. The general theme is devotion to God and His law, and it's easy to break up into short chunks for your easy, periodic digestion. The Psalter winds down with several psalms of unmitigated praise for God for this, that, and the other thing. A good representative is the very last one, Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise Him for His mighty deeds. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with trumpet sound. Praise Him with the lute and harp. Praise Him with tambourine and dance. Praise Him with strings and pipe. Praise Him with sounding cymbals. Praise Him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Okay, the long two books are out of the way. Now let's spend some time on the lighter material. Actually, there is no lighter material. The next book in this list is Proverbs. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. To know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing in righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth, let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance, to understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Nice and clear. The author is listed. There's a statement of purpose. This sets the tone. This book is going to be easy. In some ways, it really is easy. Most of its contents are beautifully straightforward. They're just simple wisdom for getting through life in one piece. Chapter 3, verse 27. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to do it. Not much room for argument over interpretation. Chapter 6, verses 10 and 11. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber, and want like an armed man. It's obvious what it means, and it's obviously true. Chapter 11, verse 28. Whoever trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like a green leaf. More of the same. Not all of the Proverbs are this concise. There are sections and entire chapters devoted to stretching out metaphors for wisdom and folly as two women competing for a young man's affection, or examining a central theme at great length. But the hard part usually isn't understanding the instructions. The hard part is following them. If you do follow them, though, you'll be in pretty good shape, and you'll be glad you did. Ecclesiastes, the fourth wisdom book, is similar to Proverbs, but mostly it's Solomon's notebook of what he found in searching for the meaning of life. It takes a deeply pessimistic tone, for example, in chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem, and I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and a striving after wind. That theme will come up again and again throughout the book, and he never really comes up with a solid logical answer to the problem of vanity. He tries everything he can imagine, hoping to find lasting satisfaction and an escape from the misery of life. And while he finds enjoyment along the way and is able to see that wisdom is better than folly, he keeps concluding that even wisdom is ultimately a waste of time. Why? The wise person has his eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. And yet, I perceive that the same event happens to all of them. Then I said in my heart, what happens to the fool will happen to me also. Why then have I been so very wise? And I said in my heart that this also is vanity. For of the wise, as of the fool, there is no enduring remembrance, seeing that in the days to come all will have been long forgotten. How the wise dies, just like the fool. So I hated life. It's all going to end in death, no matter what he does. He can't get past that. It's the end of each line of reasoning and each search for meaning. His conclusion is found in chapter 9, verses 7 through 10. Go, eat your bread with joy, and drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already approved what you do. 
Let your garments be always white. Let not oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that he has given you under the sun, because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol to which you are going. He's saying, have fun while you're here, but your life is still vain. It's pointless. He can't get any further solely through logic and reason. But his moral compass tells him that we have a responsibility to God, too. And that's where he leaves the book in chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Well, we don't really have time for Song of Solomon, so what? what's that? We, we, do, we do have time? I thought we specifically arranged the other four so that we'd run out of time before we got to the book about sex. Wasn't long-winded enough today? Okay. Song of Solomon is a slightly raunchy love story. Love here having its less dainty and more um, sweaty definition. Okay, it's not that extreme really, but it certainly does focus on physical chemistry more than, say, building a home or raising a family or growing old together. Traditionally, this book has been read as a simple allegory between Christ and the church. And that's a fine way of reading it. But, of course, let's keep in mind that it would be almost a thousand years between its writing and its making any sense at all in that line of interpretation, which prompts me to ask, what did God intend for the Jews to get out of this book then? It could stand just as easily as an allegory for God and his bride, the nation of Israel, and it wouldn't be the only time that God described their roles in that way. But just like the problem of seeing Jesus and only Jesus everywhere in the Psalms, it would be a mistake to ignore the simple physical interpretation in favor of a higher order spiritual meaning. This book does an excellent job of describing the joys of physical love as God designed it to be enjoyed by husbands and wives. The poem is organized almost like a play, with a female speaker, the Shulamite, and a male speaker, the Shepherd, and a chorus of onlookers who help to advance the narrative outside of the direct monologue and dialogue. Some examples of the intense physical imagery. Chapter 2, verse 3, from the female perspective. As an apple tree among the trees of the forest, so is my beloved among the young men. With great delight I sat in his shadow, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Sustain me with raisins, refresh me with apples, for I am sick with love. His left hand is under my head, and his right hand embraces me. Chapter 3, still from the female perspective. Scarcely had I passed them, when I found him whom my soul loves. I held him and would not let him go until I had brought him into my mother's house and into the chamber of her who conceived me. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or the does of the field, that you not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. Before I read you this next section, I should point out that there's this really creepy feature of the book where the man calls his love interest, my sister, my bride, a bunch of times, and it's tough for us to hear anything after that phrase because... You, But I assure you, it's not actually about incest. It's just a common cultural way of couples referring to each other, and it's not solely the Israelites who did this. We find it creepy, but you can see the reason for it. A strong bond of family and friendship, rivaled only by sibling relationships, although with some pretty important differences. With that out of the way, hopefully now you can pay closer attention to the important details of chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. I came to my garden, my sister, my bride. I gathered my myrrh with my spice. I ate my honeycomb with my honey. I drank my wine with my milk. Eat, friends, drink, and be drunk with love. I slept, but my heart was awake. A sound, my beloved is knocking. Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. For my head is wet with dew, my locks with the drops of the night. I had put off my garment. How could I put it on? I had bathed my feet. How could I soil them? My beloved put his hand to the latch, and my heart was thrilled within me. I arose to open to my beloved, and my hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with liquid myrrh, on the handles of the bolt. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had turned and gone. 
Okay, if you didn't understand what some of those metaphors are supposed to mean, then no, I am not going to explain them to you. Maybe you should go ask your parents what it means. Or maybe it's more likely you should go ask your kids what it means and they might be able to fill in some of the gaps for you. I don't know. Either way, good luck. I expect it'll be an uncomfortable conversation. If you're still sketchy on what's going on here and trying to look at the Bible through a vid angel filter, then this next section will have to just be blotted out entirely. Chapter 7, verse 1. How beautiful are your feet in sandals, O noble daughter! Your rounded thighs are like jewels, the work of a master hand. Your navel is a rounded bowl that never lacks mixed wine. Your belly is a heap of wheat encircled with lilies. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle. Your neck is like an ivory tower. Your eyes are pools in Heshbon by the gate of beth -Rabim. Your nose is like a tower of Lebanon, which looks toward Damascus. Your head crowns you like Carmel, and your flowing locks are like purple. A king is held captive in the tresses. How beautiful and pleasant you are, O loved one, with all your delights. Your stature is like a palm tree, and your breasts are like its clusters. I say I will climb the palm tree and lay hold of its fruit. O oh, may your breasts be like clusters of the vine, the scent of your breath like apples, and your mouth like the best wine. It goes down smoothly for my beloved, gliding over lips and teeth. I am my beloved's, and his desire is for me." Okay, I'm gonna have to stop. There's just not much that I can get away with saying in commentary on this, so I hope it speaks for itself well enough. I will venture one point of guidance. Your belly is a heap of wheat is probably not a pickup line that will be tremendously successful for you. This book ought to be viewed just like anything in context. Part of the reason Christians tend to shy away from it is that it's so well, lustful. But there is a place for sexual lust within marriage, and that's the context of the relationship being described in Song of Solomon. Now, I'm off to go find my wife. Oh, right, we're not done yet. Uh, let's wrap this up by getting our minds out of the gutter and going back to the point Solomon tried to get across to us in Ecclesiastes. However much enjoyment we may find in the physical pleasures of life, food, drink, sex, money, friendship, accomplishment, what have you, it's ultimately all vain. You can't take it with you. You're going to end up just as dead, whether you're rich or poor, wise or a fool, married or lonely, a parent or childless, even righteous or evil. Solomon's point is, which would you rather have, even understanding that it's all pointless? But we can go beyond that. Jesus came here and died for us, not so that we could take our wealth or fame with us after death, but so that we wouldn't have to take our sin with us. He loves his church as the shepherd loved his bride. And we look forward to a reconciliation and consummation of sorts when he returns. Will you be a part of his bride when he comes? Or will you be left desolate in the dark and cold? All of these books are pointing the way toward Christ and enjoying him forever but they're not a full map. If you'd like to learn more, please get in touch with us at River Ridge and we'd love to help you. You can reach us at 812-550-6234 or info at riverridgechurch.org and we'd be happy to study with you, teach you, encourage you, and help you find the narrow way that leads to life. Please get in touch with us. This was a fun one to write and present and I hope you got a lot out of it. I know I did. Thanks for joining me on Iron Sharpens Iron.